Uh, well, Charlotte, you know, thank you so much for uh, joining us in our little car interview, our little tour of Amsterdam uh, in our fancy Audi, uh, which we uh, are really thankful we were able to borrow. It's a lot of fun. Uh, do you want to kind of introduce yourself to our guests? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. This is really fun. I'm Charlotte Dunlap. I am a research uh, d uh, director at Global Data, and um, I've been there for some time now actually covering application platforms for for about a decade and so i'm really following a lot of developer technology over these years which you know started out being about middleware and then with the cloud advent of the cloud that moved into paths mm -hmm. and um yeah and then all kinds of fun cool emerging technologies that have come off of that of course right um, and so of course uh, well, so Kubernetes. Eventually. And eventually. And a, much, exactly. a much more kind of sophisticated concept than PaaS in some ways. Yes, that's right. Particularly that would bring in the operational side of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, developers figured out pretty early how to pull a credit card out and order up AWS services initially because they were under the gun to create applications much faster than they used to. Right. Uh, they used to have, say, nine months to procure hardware and software, <laughs> you know, yeah. in the old days, yeah, with monolithic apps. And now suddenly they had to, to do this, uh, you know, with digital transformation in a matter of weeks or even days so yep. um, so that switched all that up and that went along fine for a while until operations teams wanted to get their arms around what they were doing <laughs> what they were running what they yeah. were running God yeah and yeah. so so you're right so so enter um, kubernetes and uh, right around well and, and then of course I don't need to mention the last few years have been really tough between the pandemic and uh, geopolitical issues and a shaky economy and and that's kind of exacerbated what enterprises are dealing with and what operations yeah. teams are up against and so again everybody's been looking to kubernetes to solve all of this um, and it has addressed a lot of the pain points um, by these teams in in you know, pain points such as more demands on IT, an explosion of data, and uh, increased endpoints um, by offering a cloud infrastructure that that as a scalable and elastic platform, and also offers cognitive services and right. other disruptive services, and that's all good, but. But Kubernetes definitely has its problems as well, uh, which which is has to do with enterprises not always having the kind of solutions that abstract the complexities around configuration of these new application architectures, and and that's that's tricky. And so you know, especially in distributed apps. Right. So so that's kind of laying a little bit of the groundwork for you, LinkedIn, on you know the the pros and cons of. Kubernetes, um, which brings us to where we are now, which is unfortunately we've got this big, huge technology skills gap uh, globally, and so um, we're we're at this point where vendors are are looking to how they can help their customers because I think vendors are seeing that that enterprises uh, recognize that um, it's it's better for them if they can tap existing talent, mm -hmm. um, then companies can leverage employees' institutional knowledge. Right. And that's very valuable to them to be able to do that. So it just feels like every other Although, day. Like, yeah, uh, to be honest, right, that's actually one of my pet peeves about the industry is that, you know, a lot of the times with recruiting for software engineers, you know, people are looking for, you know, a Python person with, you know, seven years of experience and, you know, two years with this particular module and stuff and it, and the problem with that is that I think it, it makes the gap worse because like you know if somebody has you know an object oriented you know software development design background you know it doesn't really kind of matter what language it was that they you know kind of grew up in 
if yes. you can give them a bit of time to learn whatever this new thing is, you know, yeah. you can get, you know, somebody who has, you know, someone who has 10 years of programming, programming yeah. experience, it doesn't actually really matter that much as far as the mm. language is concerned, as long as you can give them some time to kind of, you know, you need to learn that new toolbox actually with my students yeah. when I, when I talk about, um, like Python and what Python modules are and stuff, you know, I'm like, you know, imagine that you're like a carpenter, right? Or like another kind of construction work or whatever. And you have a whole set of tools in your garage, but you don't go to every job with all the tools, right? <laughs> you, you take a couple of toolboxes cause you know, this job is going to need it. And that's what we do with Python modules, right? Is that you need, you know, you need to have this set of tools so you don't build everything from scratch, but they're, you know, they're, they're kind of similar. Like if I borrow your hammer, it's still a hammer, right? You know, it takes me a little while maybe to know the the details of the weight or whatever of your hammer, but you know, they're they're all kind of at the end of the day, it's like I know how to program. I can figure out this particular language in this particular set of libraries. I just might need a little bit of time to come up to speed. And so what I'm what I'm hoping is that some of the things that you're talking about are gonna actually lead us to allow for kind of software engineers to to kind of migrate um, more into you know kind of coming from you know their Java developers and going over to Python or you know or vice versa mm -hmm. and can we actually address some of that skills gap right or or the the uh, people gap really um, by allowing more latitude in movement. For sure. And, and then, okay, I know the big joke always is how, how many minutes does it take someone here at KubeCon to bring up ChatGPT, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but with what you just were talking about, um, then then even if you're not familiar with a, a language, um, you, you know, leveraging that to for converting the scripts, right? Yeah, Especially yeah. into languages that you're, you're less familiar with. So yeah, I agree with you. You've got that kind of basic uh, information. It certainly does apply in, in various ways. Right, right. And ChatGPT in some ways is is really just kind of, you know, broader stack overflow, right? I mean, like, you know, it's funny, I used to, and I talk about this a bunch on the show, but it's like, you know, when I was consulting, I'd have grand plans of what I was gonna build on the plane, right? And then I realized when I'm on the plane, I can't actually code without the internet. Like, I, you know, I, I need to be able to like, so I'm like, oh wait, how do I do this in this particular language? I can't remember, so I have to go yes. look it up. Yes. Um, right. You know, and it's, it's super weird, you know, that, uh, you know, like, I just I have a really hard time programming without the internet and I think you know that's not necessarily a bad thing right no and this is what I understand too I I have been talking with a lot of developers or wannabe developers mm -hmm. meaning especially in particular guys that are sys admins that want to reinvent themselves mm -hmm. and frankly I'm I'm underplaying them they're they're really moving into it coding a lot but you're mm -hmm. right they tell me they they google a lot yeah. of how to build these apps and um and and they spend hours doing it and so I I tell people I don't really care about chat GPT and uh, as far as um kids that are using it to write their papers you probably do because you're a yeah, professor yeah, yeah, but yeah. um but what i'm hearing from these these folks that you know new coders is that it saves them so much time with providing this baseline coding yep, that yep. they would have spent hours on the weekend working on right and then like i said and helping them convert script well and, and this is one of the big challenges a lot of the times with like new software projects or whatever is like the the setup time where bef well before you're like actually adding any value mm -hmm. uh is is high effort and just in even for like a professional developer it's just infrequent enough that you have to like relearn it every time oh, you know wow. so it's like you know if I set up a web server or something I have to go and dig up the docs on Apache to find out exactly how I set that up every time because yeah. the gap between when I do it the you know one time and the next project is just long enough for me to forget it all sure. um, and you know because yeah. it, it, even though I've done it I don't know at least hundreds if not close to a thousand times <laughs> You know, wow. I still kind of have to go, like, go re-up on the docs and just be like, okay, and plus the fact that it may have changed. It might have gotten better in some way, or maybe they, they changed it a little bit in another way. So mm, I'd have to relearn it. And sure, so sure. I think tools like where you're kind of, you know, and, and we've been chasing this grail for a long time. Uh, you know, I've personally written uh, three production level code generator applications, right? Um, you know, one way back in the day based on UML, 
um, you know, where you drew out the architecture you wanted and it would generate you a baseline application and then you could yes. actually turn it into what you needed. So I think it's a, a, a huge benefit, the thing yeah. that as teachers and, uh, you know, uh, other kinds of roles like that, what we need to figure out is like, okay, now how do we incorporate it? Um, actually, Boston University, the, the part I'm in, I'm in what's called the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences, okay. and we just released our um, policy on it, which is that you can use ChatGPT, uh, but you have to cite it. Um, okay. And so, if you're if you're doing that and taking that approach, okay, you yeah, know. Um, yeah, of course. And I swear, one of the things that I try, so we do these classes that are we call them practicum or practica um, classes, where we're actually doing having student teams work on projects for third parties, um, nice. and they walk into the project and they get assigned to the project, and it's uh, no JS project, and the student team will say, well, we don't have anybody on the team that knows Node.js. And I'm like, um, okay, Google it. Yeah. You know, like yeah. this, what you have to learn to be an industry professional is uh -huh. how to learn uh -huh. about these things to quickly solve. and, yeah. and yeah, and identify, uh -huh. Uh -huh. okay, you know, the things like, I know these things about Python, so what I need to do is kind of know those same things in Node.js mm -hmm. or JavaScript or whatever, and then... Uh -huh. What I remember, what's funny is that because I've done so many different languages, the things I remember about a language are the things that are weird. Um, and so that way, because those are the things that are very difficult to look up, right? Oh, sure. You know, but sure. me looking up how to do a okay. for loop in Python is, you know, half a second. Um, yeah. But knowing, you know, how do you do, um, you know, threading models on in um, in Python that involve, uh, you know, long time connections, that's using Twisted, which is an unusual framework, yeah. but has a very important use case. But that I can tell you off the top of my head. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, that's great. No, that's real life skills that they're learning there, including, as you say, how to just solve a problem that, you know, you, you can't just tell the client. Yeah. Oh, no, no, we're not. Yeah, yeah, we're not we don't do we don't do this one. Yeah. That, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 So what I'm, um, you know, back to these these vendor training programs again mm -hmm. I it just feels like I'm hearing about a new one now every other day because of this, like I said this the, how relevant they are that these cloud and platform providers are realizing how much their customers are needed and and you know Red Hat has such a cool example with Ford Motor Company You're right, and, right and basically what Red Hat's done for them is just gone in you know on site for them offering a free self-service um, training so again they can do that upskilling and, and reskilling and um, we, we see training in those two areas upskilling is pretty obvious it's expanding your knowledge of new technology reskilling is about looking at, at employees that have the um, the aptitude for moving into to new areas so right so say you're an accountant just an example you know your accountant maybe you could become a uh, um, data scientist well <laughs> I mean, at, at data science, maybe there's a lot maybe, of overlap there. Okay, actually, I was <laughs> yeah. going to say maybe like a security admin. Oh, right, yeah, okay. yeah. And then, and then, say you're um, here. Let's see, what's what's another example? A graphic artist. Maybe you might become a UX designer. You right, know, just yeah. kind of leveraging some of your core talents. But anyway, that that's kind of what we see is is reskilling, and um, and so. Anyway, just again to use Red Hat as an example, and I'll mention other vendors, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, I know it's got 17, they call them training paths, I believe. And actually, oh, the I, learning I, paths? I'm sorry, the learning yeah. paths, very yeah. good. I, I spoke with a Red Hat guy yesterday who said they're adding another one. They just decided um, uh, CubeVert. Does that mm -hmm. sound familiar yep. to you? Yep. Yeah, for VM. Yeah, I can't remember what it launches exactly, it's, but it's, yeah, it's very v soon. It's VM workloads on Kubernetes. Right. Which is, um, so one of the things I always like to mention about that is like, mm. it's the, you know, why do you want to do that? Well, because you maybe aren't prepared or aren't interested in moving a particular application to being quote unquote like cloud native, mm. but you can get that kind of single pane of glass where everything is being managed by the same environment um, by, you know, kind of just bringing that VM over. Now, 
there's also use cases where you really do need a virtual machine because you want some yeah. specialties of the kernel or something that you can't get with containerization. Okay. Um, okay. But those are pretty unusual, um, and mm. you know, but there are definitely common use cases where it's like it's just not valuable to anybody to actually convert this particular application to like being cloud native because it does what it does and it does it fine, you know. And yeah. so, you, but if you can bring it in, then at least you can keep track of it in the same way and you can you can start to use some of the really nice points of an orchestration layer where you know if you if you want to do auto scaling and things like that you can still deal with that but you don't necessarily need to make a full move to a you know mm, cloud native or okay. containerized application. I see. Yeah. Okay, hey you just made me think of something else when you when you said something. Um, to me too, I feel like we've gotten to this place in time because of some of these cool emerging technologies I was mentioning that I've been following for some years. Um, low code platforms is an mm -hmm. obvious one. Intelligent automation, RPA, robotic process automation. I feel like these kind of technologies helped usher in where we're at today as far as these training programs mm -hmm. because to me they broadened the audience that is able to have access to this high productivity technologies that right. usually were, were once just reserved for those elite data scientists those those guys or you know, or like 4gl kind of software right? right so um and you know mm. that's they have a very you know like um like they're not very common anymore but like power base was that one of them power something or another mm. um and so they had these very specialized you know language models and all this stuff oh, but they okay. made you a much more performant developer right at the expense of universality right um yeah, yes and, sure. and so we're, there's always that trade-off right so we're starting to find a much uh -huh. I, at least i think a much better happy medium yes. where we can kind of get a lot of those advantages without as bad trade-offs um as the old 4gl um you know yeah. programming languages power base that's what it's called oh yeah. got it okay yeah. okay yeah, and speaking of that, I mean, so so some of these automation solutions like Microsoft Power Platform. Oh, like um, Power BI? That one? Yes, yes. Yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, IBM Cloud Packs for business yep. automation. Yeah. Well, this is my oh, big... Oh, Salesforce Flow. Again, these are these are platforms that have... They, they include technology that just used to be reserved for the, the savvy, the pro right. developers yep. and data scientists. And, and now they're really expanding to much broader non-coding. Right, so, right. Sorry I interrupted you. Oh, no, no worries. I was just, um, you know, it's like one of the things that I'm uh, like where uh, we kind of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, software, right, is a lot about pendulum swings and kind mm -hmm. of getting it in the middle. Um, and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and PaaS uh, is something I, I really quite miss but also understand didn't quite hit the right like sweet mm. you know spot mm. because um, one of the things about those kind of tools it's, it's really nice as a developer to be just kind of like okay here's your entire platform yeah. this is all the stuff you'll need yeah. it's just right there right. Um, the problem for most of the paths is uh, was that those those platforms were very difficult to maintain build and maintain um, and so okay. what I'm hoping was we'll see a, a next generation of those That's with some point. of these things or you know or they'll kind of be delivered in a different way so like you know some of the things you're talking about but also things like uh, the operators um, those are yeah. huge for that because you can say oh vendor what what is the best way to deploy and operate your application so that I can use it in my application? Because I don't really care about right. how your application works. Right. I care about the value add I'm putting that's going to consume some service of yours. That's so true. And, and that right there is what I always say has what ha has been the barrier of adoption of a lot of this technology that, that we're talking about that, that people have come out with, mm -hmm. but the difficulty and great, oh, there's that museum. Yeah, cool. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I keep driving around and like uh, I'm not. Uh, so I'm, in some ways, I'm not really seeing a lot of this stuff, oh, right? Because I'm paying attention great. to the conversation and the, and so the bikes I. and the and oh, the cars my. and stuff. Well, right. you don't have. You're not driving, yeah, right? right. Uh, so yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> it's it's nice when you point out stuff um, yeah. because uh, we do have the roof camera, so uh, our oh, audience should be able to see it too. So okay. um, yeah. yeah, it's kind yeah. of a lot of fun. Yeah, Jan Vermeer is has an exhibit here. Oh, ah, nice. Uh huh. Girl with a pearl earring. Uh, but anyway, so so that is the difficulty. Um, 
we've got, you know, you've got slick developers, even low code, no code developers mm -hmm. that are creating apps, but then they throw it over to operations and it's like, okay, what do I do yeah, now? Right. You know, how yeah. do I move this into production? And they can do it, but there's a lot of refactoring. There's a lot of configuration. A, a lot of the difficulty has not yet been abstracted to the level it should mm -hmm. be. And, and that's the, the real tricky part. And again, that goes back to our little theme here right. of, of needing more professionals um, to, or, or again, reskilling people right. to be able to. Yeah, one of the things we were talking about earlier, um, or like with a, another interview, um, we we're talking about how um, when you, when, you know, it's it's so much better if you can actually have, you know, the, the not necessarily the operators, like the operations team, but kind of someone who's in that neighborhood mm. um, actually kind of reach into the development teams and work with the development teams with their first, you know, mm. applications in those kinds of environments or, uh, you know, okay. or something like that. Like you, if you can kind of show them how to operate those development you know activities and then and and his point was this is the key is then automate it as much as humanly right. possible Absolutely. Um, the the benefits then you, you know you you have way less of that problem where when they're bringing it in okay now we actually want to deploy it to production now you don't have as many problems that you know the yes. operations team for example has to deal with um, for sure and that the, makes sense. yeah so they having like uh, and his point was really that um, it's not so much about DevOps as much as like making sure that whether you have silos or don't have silos, but his mm -hmm. argument was silos are okay. But if you, it's more that make yeah. sure you're reaching across the lines. Yes. That, that it's not, you know, it's not a That's hard ideal. division, you know. You're right, and silos are okay because guess what? That's the reality. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, oh man, I'll probably be hated for saying this, but yeah. DevSecOps, I don't know, man, that's just not happened yet. So, because, great, you know, we want to tell developers just put aside your day job and, and learn security now. Right. It's I just, mean, it would be great, but it's just not practical. It doesn't seem like it's it's flying and um, and maybe it shouldn't. Maybe this is stuff that, that needs to just be snapped on or, or built on. Or it's, yeah, or, I mean, even if it is, like, you know, security can be difficult, right? Because it does need to be integrated at kind of a deep level. Sure. But that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be the same human. You know, it's mm -hmm. like one of the problems I have with this whole concept of, you know, full stack developers mm -hmm. is, you know, I remember the days when people were full stack developers because we had to be, because there was no striation between skill sets. <laughs> and so I just had to do the, you know, massively ugly buttons on my websites because there wasn't anybody else. So right? you mean like as in front end and back end right so like oh, yeah exactly so wow. so what's wow. funny is like no we have different skills what we need to I think we need to do a better job is figuring out how we work better together without kind of the concept of it's not really a handoff which is coming kind of comes from a waterfall model where you yes. know if we this is why I often complain that um, you know what we do in software, the software world is not engineering. Um, it's yeah. much more like writing a book. Yeah. Um, because yeah. what we want to do is we want to have a relationship between the UX person. So, like for example, sure. I had a student team really recently where the UX person had done a design and then the engineer came along and said, um, you know, hey, this framework that we chose is probably not going to be able to meet that design. And I'm like okay, did you talk to the UX person about changing the design so that it can work with the framework we've already chosen? And he was like, no, is that an option? I'm like, yes, that's the point, right? Is that, you know, we don't know without talking to the yeah. UX person. We have to play nicely together. Right, whether, whether <laughs> it, like, is there some really specific reason why they chose those particular icons? Yeah. If there was, then we'll go change the framework. But if yeah. there wasn't, maybe they can just change the UI, you know? Um, and there I think that's go. the problem. It's it's not yeah. handoffs. It's we gotta have conversations. We gotta work together and be like teams. It's much more of the agile scrum thing, right. I think, than, than kind of true DevOps models. Yeah, that's really interesting. There was an interesting announcement that came out a year ago at one of the big conferences, um, AWS Studio, Amplify Studio. Uh, I remember both you know both those I, names, but I'm not sure which okay. one you're referring to. Um, okay, it was it would be Amplify, and what it 
I'm pretty sure I'm remembering it. But but the point is, it for the first time, it was saying to front-end developers, hey, guess what? We are now giving you access to back-end development. And, mm. and I, I looked at that like, what? That's yeah. unheard of, yeah. um, but pretty amazing. Yeah. But, uh, because again, that that's the really tricky. Well, there's there's another product that that we um, we've been experimenting with at, okay. at school, which is I think it's for Figma, but it's basically a plug into Figma, which okay. will, based on a UI, generate an application. Oh. Um, and again, wow. kind of it's more like, and this is like I said, I wrote a bunch of code generators, and one of the things that we learned was that mm. it's it's really good to generate like the base, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be right. It can be yes. the 80, 20 rule where That's it's just like the right point. architecture. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which then you can modify to be the right, the right thing, right. you know? Um, so I think exactly. it's super interesting. Um, and I, I'm curious, this is why, you know, it's kind of interesting to be kind of on the university side um, because, you know, we have researchers who are way far ahead of where we are yeah. and we have all these, uh, you know, we have a lot of students who want to get into industry, right? So they're doing right. stuff that's very common day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so I kind of see a lot of the whole gamut. But Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. Uh, what else did we want to talk about? Um, so, what uh, would you say has been the highlight of, of your trip uh, to, you know, Amsterdam KubeCon uh, this time? Oh, boy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what can I say? This is my first time in, in Europe. I, I always go to KubeCon. Uh, oh, but, in, the, but you know in what? the U.S.? Yeah. Yes, but it's great. It's multi-vendors here, so you get access to everybody. It's not just a one vendor conference. Mm -hmm. um, just the different discussions with everybody just in the lunchroom and, and some of the user panels and right. things I've been seeing and, and keynotes. I don't always understand all the different project updates, but uh -huh. but it's interesting. Oh, definitely uh, new, new open source technologies. And uh, you always just walk away with a handful of these things, you know, I mean, yep. backstage, it's cool getting to know that better that that technology and it's funny and where that might go backstage uh mm -hmm. for the last so i do the show like monthly um and for the last like five episodes so the last five months or something it's come up just kind of <laughs> organically i thought i was being original in every one of no it's just crazy <laughs> is it clearly it is meeting some need yes um, Excuse me, that people yeah. are starting to notice that mm -hmm. they have a need for. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's been really interesting. And, and I, I've been particularly noticing it because I hadn't heard of it until I went to Detroit for uh, KubeCon North America. And I came back and I want to implement it uh, at the school for the projects yeah. we do because we have, you know, we have very high turnover, right? Every every yeah. semester we turn over 300 employees, yeah. um, you know, because of all of our student teams go away and then right. we get another crop, right? But the projects live longer than that. Oh. And so it, it we have a very hard time of transitioning from uh -huh. one group to the next because not only do you have typical transition problems, but the students might just be gone, right? They right, might have graduated right. or, you know, or they're just not available because they're doing 37 other classes, you know, or whatever. Yeah. So uh, we really want to implement something like backstage to, you know, and we try mm. to do like good handoff documentation mm -hmm, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But even just keeping track of where all the pieces are well, is sure. difficult. And what you're describing isn't just unique for a university either. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that would resonate with a lot of uh, Red Hat and, or, or general enterprises and customers yeah, yeah. is um, the turnover and wait, when Joe leaves, the, this right. place will fall over. Right, Nobody right. knows where. I did. I did more than one consulting gig where, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we were trying to do was build the thing to make sure that when Joe left, uh, the company didn't fall over. Exactly. Um, you know, normally a okay. lot of spreadsheets getting converted into like an application yeah. uh, was, uh, yeah, mind blowing. Um, but uh, yeah, so like I said, we have this very pronounced turnover problem uh, that I think is significant or hopefully significantly worse than most enterprises. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah. you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get to a solution that is actually consumable by other people. Um, no, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's great. But definitely the, the dominating theme, no big shocker is gen AI and chat GPT. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. But yeah. you know, I, um, we're all enjoying getting to know it. Uh, it's definitely on, on my agenda of, um, being included in a lot of my reports and mm -hmm. doing a lot more coverage in that area. 
and so I'm I'm enjoying that. I'm I like getting everybody's take. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it's um, it's funny. Like I've been I, I've also been like kind of looking at a lot of. Um, kind of teacher positions on it. And one that I thought was really interesting was, you know, chat GPT, like for a writing assignment, you know, in theory can just generate it. Um, but what this, I think it was an English teacher found was that, you know, it's it like, especially in the middle, it's kind of like, mm -hmm. and so what she started doing or what she's experimenting with is that she's now giving all of the good parts from the chat GPT chat GPT generated answer to a written, you know, a writing prompt and removing the bad parts and then asking the students, okay, now your class, the work is to fill in the parts that chat GPT couldn't oh, do well. That's, see, that's so, so clever. it's kind of like, it's kind of like the programming with here's the, you know, here's your boilerplate. Yeah. Now make it into a yeah. compelling argument or, you know, I think it's like a persuasive paper. You or know something. what? I like that but, because it's all so realistic and I'm not trying to say plagiarism is going to be okay one day, but, um, I mean, I, my background's journalism and, yeah. and analyst and, um, uh, it, it, it being a really good researcher is important mm -hmm. and so um yeah in that capacity uh, the other thing i was going to say about it is it's really interesting i'm hearing an overall theme by a lot of the vendors and executives speaking about yeah. okay gen ai is going to take years this is going to take a long time we need to be careful it's got to be ex explainability and, and this right. and that and, and i was listening to a, another panel today saying it and as i did i got this text from my 26 year old son that said mom look chat gpt is now on snapchat Oh um, yeah, and, yeah. As right. this guy is saying, this is going to take years yeah. to become part of our products. And it's like you know, uh, and I no, get it. No, it's it. not. I, <laughs> I know they have an agenda that right. they want to be the ones to be providing it, but but you gotta. You're gonna have to move faster you're, than that. You're gonna have to move faster than that, yeah. and just recognize that in some capacity, it is here today. Right. Right. Um, but but be but be the thought leaders on how it's going to be implemented, the, the bits that are going to be implemented today, and then the bits that we want to be careful and move more slowly on. Yep. A vendor certainly can serve that role of well, being and, the thought leaders on on how we go about that. And that's why, why we kind of put out that policy as the faculty, right, is that we said, you know, uh, you know, uh, we're kind of an unusual unit, but, um, because we were like, we need to embrace this now. Um, and yeah. we need to embrace it in on yeah. our terms. Um, and then we can kind of embrace it and say, you know, these are the parts we understand and these are the mm -hmm. parts we don't know yet. Yeah. Um, but here's, here's our current thinking mm -hmm. and then we can evolve that over time. Absolutely. But if we kind of pretend like, you know, the, you know, uh, it, what was in Pandora's box? I can't remember now. Um, but you know, if, if we try to pretend what you know, Pandora's box wasn't opened, uh -huh. we're going to be in trouble. You know, absolutely. So. No, that's a very good way to go about it. Um, be, and that's a realistic attitude yeah. too. Yeah. That's probably because you work with students. You work with all kinds. Well, of and, and our particular for... unit, like we um, we focus on. So we do a data science major, but the um, the major kind of has two tracks within it. Oh, yeah? One is you want to become a PhD in data science and you want to advance the next piece of machine learning. Oh. But there's another track, which, and that's the typical academic track, right? When you go to university, what you're really going there in a lot of ways for is, is how to be like an academic, how to, you know, how to advance that field, whatever oh. it is. Um, and then, but we have, we've introduced another track, which is the practitioner track. Okay. And so the baseline, a lot of the baseline stuff is the same. Um, but then you're, your, uh, you know, kind of like capstone type work and, um, you know, and the major, um, you know, and the, your later year work is more on the consumption or usage and proper usage of things like TensorFlow or whatever, rather right. than building the next TensorFlow, you know? Like the practical uses, in other yeah. words, you mean? Okay. Just in case the audience doesn't know, Global Data is an analyst oh, firm. I meant to say that. Yeah, and uh, yeah. that you know, pretty yeah. good size too, as it's, I recall. It's good size. We are um, Global Data is based in London. We are we do data analysis. We consist of a number of research and analyst firms that that do a vast array of um, of materials, data for our. our clients, for our customers, uh, from surveys to thematic 
big, massive, I call them monster reports yeah, on, yeah. On, on topics to event reports, uh, very timely, very, very quick. That right. just helps give enterprises some direction on where the market's going and, and where their opportunities So not everyone has to keep are. up with everything all the time. That's right. right. That, that's what we do. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Sorry about the uh, slight confusion about no, uh, no. where we're going to uh, end our drive. No, um, but at least you. you got a nice little tour of Amsterdam. I the loved weather it. got much better than it was this morning. Very um, good. Which is nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. It's my turn to drive now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs>